company, delivery, and time. When we talk about niche, oh, when we talk about financial mastery, I took a, I mean, I'm a psychology major, so when I teach business finance, it's really fun and basic. Yeah? We just use, you know, multiplication, plus, minus, division, that's it. Okay? And I learned that from a Texan millionaire called Keith Cunningham. If you've read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, basically Robert Kiyosaki was, this is Robert Kiyosaki's mentor. He's a very low profile guy, but now he's just, He's just come out as a speaker at 60. Okay, so this guy has been doing invest. He, he does what you guys experience. He is a he brings in investors for companies. He buys and sells companies. He's a broker, you know. So he's got a lot of financial skills. And one of the my favorite books um, from him was the Ultimate Blueprint for a Highly Successful Business. He says up front in the introduction, this is not a book about how to do better marketing. This is a book about how to increase your profits and your cash by understanding the finance of your business, not by bringing in new clients, right? So I love it. He does it, and he, he's funny, he's a cowboy, so obviously the, the twang is entertaining. He says, sales is vanity. A lot of business people say, I want to increase my sales, I want to increase my sales. Profit is sanity. The only reason why you need sales is to make more profit. If your sales, your pricing, or whatever, is not calculated correctly because you don't know how, and you are not making enough profit, then it's really little, little, to be profit, no up, up. Basically, you're working for a non-profit organization called your company, right? But cash is king. One of the things I teach people is like, forget about profit. If you're profit, you've got, Theoretically, you've got profit because of the sale of the big deal you got, but they pay in 90 days. Basically, you've got no cash in 90 days. If your cash gap is 250 days, basically you've got a lot of dead stock in your warehouse and it's sucking up your cash. And that's why your profit is miserable because you're paying interest to people who loan you money. Okay? So there's four areas where cash hides, all these kinds of things we can go through, but that's why financial mastery is key. Cash gap. The difference between when you, the money, the time when you take out your money to pay your supplier, let's say that's day one, and then the time that your supplier, that your customer pays you, let's say that's day 90, that means you have 90 days cash gap. For a small company, one day cash gap means almost nothing. If you're dealing with like clients that I'm coaching right now, whoo, a hundred million, a uh, hundred billion per year type of companies, right? Selling marble and all these kinds of things. One day of cash gap for a, a pink marble from Milan, you know, that is a lot of cash in their, um, in their warehouse. So what we're doing right now is just reducing one day, one day cash gap. That's all we want. That's already a lot of money. Nish. Niche means no price competition. We look at all these brands. It's hard to say there's no Indonesian logos. Yet, yeah, it could be yours, right? But all this has a price. It has a, has a unique selling point. Some of them, the unique selling point is price. McDonald's will say, you know, we are the cheapest hamburger joint you can, you can get in most countries. But the other thing is McDonald's is uh, unique about is all their approach to marketing, to children. You know, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a colleague who takes on Saturdays, you know, the kids to eat wherever they want. What do you want? I want to go to McDonald's. Okay, fine. What do you want to order? Happy meal X, Y, Z. All right. Takes a happy meal, takes out the hamburger, leaves it aside, plays with the toy. And says, why aren't you eating your hamburger? I already ate at home. <laughs> what? Why are you ordering that? Well, because it's got a toy. So dad eats the hamburger. Perfect. Apple, this whole thing, different thing. They don't say, oh, we've got iPods, we've got MP3 players. No, they just, they have cool, they, they position their uh, thing as a lifestyle, right? 7-Eleven, you know, we buy tissues at a higher price than if we go to Carrefour. But why do we do it? Because of convenience. So all this, it's not really about the business. It's not, for 7-Eleven, for, for, for instance, it's not about the product. But it's amazing when some people, like, I used to have a client who's, this is it's a digital camera. Back then, there was just digital camera. There was no smartphones and everything. I'm revealing my age as we go along. 
right? Okay. So back then, back in those days, yeah, digital cameras. So he had it was a distributor from Taiwan and all these kinds of things. And then we we're talking about unique selling point. Why that then? Because everybody sells the same stuff. So yeah, but your product is not your digital camera. Your product is your business. My question is not what's unique about your product. My question is what's unique about your business. What's unique about the way you do business? Oh, service. No, no, I don't understand that. Because everybody says service. Why don't you be more specific? If your camera breaks, we do replace it while we repair it. Do people do that? No, just us. Well, that's a good start. Right? So we have a four-page questionnaire that we have to go through, and that's part of the Action Coach system. Four-page questionnaire that helps you dig through what is your market needs, what is the industrial standard, what is the industry standard in your in your industry, and then from that, the final question after four pages, and you can't skip, you've got to answer it in sequence. The final question is: So, what's your unique selling point? But many of us, without guidance, that's our first question: What's my unique selling point? That's why you never arrive at it. In coaching you, we take you the long way around, we ask you other different kinds of questions, and then we write, okay, so what is the unique selling point based on all the answers that you've come up with? And then it's clear. Okay? Are we okay now? Are we okay still? Yeah? yeah? Yes. Is this interesting? Yes. Oh, God. I get to have snacks. <laughs> so what's your unique selling point? Can you guarantee? Here's the Action Code 17-week guarantee. If you take a private coaching program, if we do not find in 17 weeks a strategy that would give you return on investment on your 17 week investment, we will keep coaching for free until we find that strategy and then we'll start building you again. Yeah? But it didn't say we'll find you the cash because we don't do the work, right? But we will find together the strategy. If you implement that strategy, we will get you back the return on investment. But if it takes you six months to implement that strategy, because sometimes it does, right, that's business, we still say we found our fee. Okay? So this is what we, our guarantee is. What's your guarantee? It doesn't matter about that, but you. Use your words, use your phrase, use your rules. Marketing is math. It should be an investment, not an expense. So you don't spend investment, uh, marketing, you invest in marketing. Therefore, we should expect to get it back. Now with online marketing, this is getting easier and easier because they will tell you what is your acquisition cost, they will tell you what is your lifetime value. You can do this with technology now, okay? But there's two sides of marketing, right? Acquisition cost and lifetime value. My question is, do you measure that? Do you know how much it costs you to buy a customer? There's a book here called Buying Customers. I thought that was a cool title because it ends up that the only thing we buy in business is customers. We don't get customers. We invest and then they come. If you, let's say, let's say you spend $10,000 on marketing and you get 10 customers, that means the purchase price of each customer is $1,000. The question is, is $1,000 greater or, or smaller than the profit of your first sale? Profit, not not revenue. Oh, my, my profit is $2,000. Great, so $1,000. Cheap, right? It's kind of like going to this strange machine, you put in $1,000 and it spits out $2,000. The question is, how many times can you put in money, $1,000 into that machine? As many as you like, right? But if this machine you put in $1,000 and it spits out $500, can you still do that kind of marketing? No. Of course you can. Are so straight. No, of course you can. That's called an investment acquisition cost. But you gotta have a strategy how they will come back and buy more, how they will get referrals for you, get their friends to buy from you. You have to have that justification. You can't just say, yes, I will get it somehow. No, you've got to, some people in some of your businesses, it's impossible to have an acquisition cost that is lower than the first profit. Right? Let's say what you're selling is really cheap stuff. 1%, 2% margins, 3% margin, and for some reason you're crazy enough to get into that business. Right? But you can sell millions of that. Yeah? They can buy over and over and over again. It's a daily product. And okay, that makes sense. We can calculate that. The point is, it, it's not for me to say, 
can you do that and can you not do that? But it is for us as action coaches to equip you with the right questions, the right formulas, with the right framework to help you decide for yourself whether or not that makes sense. Does that make sense? Does that sound good? Right? Because you don't need a teacher saying, yes, you can do that. No, you can't do that. You don't need that. You need to be equipped to make those decisions yourself. This is a bakery that we, we um, coached. Marketing cost $300. Well, Cynthia Bakery, come. We got great bread. Type of marketing in a local neighborhood newspaper. Okay? Kawasan newspaper. Number of clients that actually came because they put a coupon in it so you can tell who came because of the ad. Ten. So the acquisition cost is $30 per client. When they purchase, they spend about $450. Their profit per client is 50%, which is $225. So obviously, this is not a making money type of marketing. Everybody with me? Yeah. Then we said, all right, well, why don't you change the ad? Make an interesting offer. Free eclair, the owner said to us. Are you crazy? You know, if we offer free eclair, you know how many people would go through our doors? A lot? Yeah. How am I going to handle that? Isn't that what you want? Oh, yeah. Okay. So let's do free eclairs. What's the cost of the eclair? 30 cents. Okay. 300 people came. It was roughly, but I just said 300 for the easy math. Okay, 200, blah, blah, blah. So, easy math, $1 per client plus the eclair, $1.30. Interesting, the psychology of consumers. When you give them stuff, they feel obliged to spend more. Uh, nobody except some strange family that just goes in there, gets an eclair and leave. They probably had all eclairs for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody just kept coming back, 17 people getting 17 <laughs> eclairs. Yeah, but it's like, you know, they spend $5.50. So we had an acquisition cost of 130. We had a profit of 275. Good marketing? That one you can do over and over again. But all this takes test and measure. Talk about lifetime value. My question is, do you know, you know lifetime value, like lifetime value is the amount of stuff, the amount of revenue that you can get off one client in the, in the course of their lifetime. So you got to define the lifetime. See, if I own the kindergarten, what is my lifetime? I don't have kids. How many years do you stay in kindergarten? Is it two? Three. Three? Okay, thank you. So my lifetime, my lifetime period is three years. Nobody repeats kindergarten. Sorry, did anyone repeat kindergarten? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. I didn't. I repeated preschool. <laughs> You know, so, so you have to know what are the factors that stops your lifetime value. For a kindergarten, it is the age of the child. So what strategies must you proactively put in place to continue that lifetime value? Like Brad Sugars has a dog food business. People will keep buying. The lifetime value of a dog food business depends on what? Whether or not the dog still eats, meaning whether or not the dog is alive. Right? All else, like service being equal, and everything like that. If the dog is dead, you stop selling dog food to them. So here's this proactive marketing strategy. Every time his client's dog dies, he gives him a new puppy. A cute little new puppy. Mind you, all puppies start small. So the poodle dies, start giving him a puppy. What kind of a puppy? Rottweilers. That's a good puppy. That'll eat a lot. <laughs> Jokes aside, whatever you do, you just have to keep, you have to analyze this, right? What are the factors that will potentially stop the purchase for my customers? For me, you will stop purchasing for me as a business coach once your business ends, right? Or once you decided, I don't want to learn anymore because I'm too smart, right? So some of the strategies that we put in place is always to create the, 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 the yearning for learning and also to get referrals. Right? Because if you, you know, you have to continue the flow, lifetime value also includes referrals. Are you trying to fix the symptom or the cause? This is getting into the second level, which is niche, right? Let's say you have two stores, store A and store B. Do they have the same problem? No. How would you say, why would you say no? Why not? Who said no? Yeah. What's store A's problem? 
Great. So the conversion rate of store A is 100%. Obviously, for every single customer that enters or clicks or whatever into that store, buys. So if you want to increase the revenue of store A, you've got to increase the number of leads. Okay, you draw more traffic in. When I return from front sessions, I'm not doing any more of this stuff, you know? I sat down with my little garage band and my MacBook Pro, right? And I recorded nine sales audios. First is about the company, second is about what we sell, the product, the coaching, what is that? Third is about the mindset of successful salespeople. Every, every audio is about 20 minutes each. And then I made a workbook that goes along with the audio so that people just don't sleep during my audios, you know? And I have a quiz and all this stuff. And I give it to my HR under a Dropbox folder and say, yeah. Every time a new salesperson comes, day one, they listen to nine audios, and then they fill out this workshop, the workbook. The next day, I'd like you to schedule two hours with me so I can go through the workbook with them, answer any questions, and then just coach you through the job. Is that okay? So instead of eight hours, now I invest only two hours because I've got a leverage system. Does that make sense? Super simple, guys. Really super simple. So the question is, and I always I'd like to end all slides with questions because the questions are the important stuff, not my stories. Question is, what is like the routine, super simple things that you can systemize tomorrow or even tonight if you want to get, if you want to work so hard, right? Super simple things. How do you divide your work so you can multiply your results? That's what an organizational structure is, really, isn't it? Nine steps to building a system, vision, mission, smart goals, culture, organizational chart, Position contracts, or people call it job description. KPIs, how-to manual, and finally milestones. There's a book called Instant Systems, if you'd like to read more details about this. But the idea is, we've broken it down for you. There's four areas you need to systemize too, by the way. HR, people in development, IT, operational delivery, and finance. And our clients, they have a choice. They can think about it themselves or if they're stuck, they have a list. There's about 19 to 21 types of systems in each of the four areas. All you need to do is just, do I have that? No. Let's circle that. Do I have that? No. Let's circle that. Have that? Yep. Skip. Next, next, next. We make a 90-day plan, which we call a growth club. We have a program where we just get entrepreneurs like yourselves for half a day, and we make a 90-day execution plan together. So you have... This community of, you know, because planning can be quite boring, right? And, and complicated if you don't know what to do. We make it really simple. Um, then you prioritize which one of these strategies do I want to implement in the next 90 days? And you just work on that. Really simple. Next three months, come back again, read off that chart again, put that in place, and keep going, right? So just try to make it simple for you, right? Because again, we're made for startup businesses. D. Why should great people, you know, everybody say, ah, it's so hard to get good people. And many of you are not there yet, so I'm just going to go through real fast. But why should great people be excited and happy to work for you? If you can't really think of a good reason, I mean, here's a question. Would you be excited if you worked for you? Would you want to work under a boss like you? If the answer is no, then yeah, let's just start thinking about other things, you know? Start thinking about how we can be better leaders instead of blaming the candidate pool about why they're so bad. Six keys to a winning team. Again, instant team building. We talk about good stuff in instant team building. We talk about the six keys to a winning team. We also talk about how to recruit, the recruitment system which uses, um, what is it, which uses, oh, we ran out of books. Woo, stock system. <laughs> we need to improve that, okay? Uh, how to improve your recruitment. How not to get fooled with these professional interviewees we have these days. Because back in my days, there's no books that tell you how to do an interview. Again, revealing age. But nowadays, before people get interviews by you, they have already read like three books, 20 blogs, and 17 websites about the top 10 interview questions and how to answer them. <laughs> Eye movements and how it determines whether or not you're lying. So they're like looking at your interview, focusing on your nose, just so their eyes don't move to the 
right, because to the right, that means you're lying. To the left, that means you're recalling. <laughs> really? Kids these days, they know this stuff. Right? And of course, everyone still uses individual interviews. Are you a hard worker? Yes. Are you proactive? Yes. <laughs> I know your interview questions aren't that basic. Or you interview based on skills, and then you fire based on attitude. Isn't that interesting? You hire based on skills, you fire based on attitude. So read that book, figure out how we get through that interview process with group interviews and deselection, not selection. So all these things, six points. Are you a strong leader? Is your goal a common goal, or is it still the owner's goal? Do you have clear culture and rules of the game? Do you know how to make a simple to execute action plan instead of this massive Excel worksheet of business project planning thing? Yeah? You gotta understand, most people are visual. Excel sheets with little tiny spots, yeah, are good for some, right? But for most people, make it easy. How do you make planning easy? You can talk to these guys right here. We use post-its, right? Okay. And then uh, all these types of things. How do you support risk? How do you get people 100% involved? Do you have the right people at the right job, doing the right things under the right boss, with the right culture, with the right peers? See, he's a good person to hire. I'm a good person to hire. But we may not be working well together unless we understand the behavior styles that we have. So we have four types of behavior styles, people who have a tendency to be good at solving problems, people who are, have the tendency to be good at relating to people. These are natural behavioral styles. And they're behavior, they're not personality. Okay, it's two different things. They can change. People who are good at keeping pace, people who are good at following procedures, they have that natural tendency. So if you have someone who is by nature very good at following procedures, but you're giving them a role that where they have to be, you know, innovative, you know, doing things that is non-procedural, they will they will struggle. It's kind of like hiring a pig and telling them to fly. Yeah, and then equipping them with wings and systems, and it's like, pigs don't fly. We have more possibilities now with the new DISC. Many of you may know DISC already. It's, been, it's the longest and most proven um, behavioral, observable behavior assessment, but we have a new version now. More possibilities, a natural and adapted that's still there, and also, once in the old version, it's about am I a D, an I, an S, or a C? It's not about that anymore. It's about what kind of a D are you, what kind of an I are you. Don't put yourself in a box. Having team reports help if you have more than one person taking the assessment because you have more than one person <coughs> working for you. It's about assessing the chemistry between the styles. Team chemistry. Splitting that further into 12 integrated behaviors. It looks maybe complicated, but it's really easy. I can understand it. So you have hope. <laughs> you know, I don't like complicated things, right? But you see, like, I'm high energy, low thinking. That's what it says, basically. I don't think, right? I just do. And then I have a, a staff member who does, uh, who thinks a lot before she does. We can pretty much annoy each other unless we understand each other, okay? Tips about how to motivate different kinds of styles. And finally, you know, you get to the stage where you are living your dream. Your team is working your business for you. You have time to duplicate your business. This is where you start buying and building other businesses. This is start where you start perhaps looking at other ventures. Once the company is finished, you need to have that clarity up front. What is the organizational structure? Even though, you know, when we, coach people to make an organizational structure. We don't say, make an organizational structure of your company now. It is make your organizational structure of your company when it is finished, when you are ready to sell it. Okay, you may be, your name might be in 20 boxes, that's fine. But the idea is, wouldn't that give you an idea of what vacancies you need to fill? Yeah? Wouldn't it give you an idea of where you need to, to build this? And then decide what's next for you. One of the, what, why I put this, because I'm not like this fluffy motivator stuff, but it is very important. We find that a lot of people give up halfway because that's not clear. You have 
you find yourself by your job and you stick to it and you refuse to remove yourself from your business because you have nothing else to do. You probably very, have very few friends left. Yeah. You probably don't have any vision of yourself outside of that desk. right? And jokes aside, this is exactly what happens when people say, I don't really want to get out of this. This is my identity. My business is my identity. I'm getting a little psychological. But yeah, I help people get out of that identity as well. So if, that's, if that's your identity, don't be surprised if you keep self-sabotaging yourself back in it. You get lots of profits, you destroy it again so that you have something better to do. It happens. Okay? So we can have questions and answers later. But never wish your life were easier, wish that you were better. Where you'll be, you will arrive. In five years, you will arrive somewhere, but I just don't exactly know where that is. Yeah? Ask our team uh, what kinds of books you need to read, what kinds of people. We have networking clubs around um, Jakarta as well that we, we host. Um, what kind of people you want to associate with, how can we help connect you with different kinds of people, and then what kind of action you take. If you want to improve your business on your own, absolutely no problem. We've got a whole bunch of books, we've got DVDs, you can take the disk assessment, just talk to my team about it. If you'd like to have accelerated, faster results with proven strategies, talk to my team also about group or private coaching, yeah? So that we can help you identify yourself with the, with the right program. Um, if you are looking to talk to us about a program, my team will basically, I mean, this is not a selling thing, yeah? Uh, so it's not the right time to talk, or, you know, maybe we can touch base a little bit and introduce myself to you and vice versa. But let's schedule a different time outside of this. And you have this business diagnostic forms that you've been given out. Tell us a bit about your business. We'll give you a call, a coach, you'll be assigned to a coach. A coach will give you a, a call and get to know a little bit about what you're looking for. And if it is still appropriate, we will make ourselves available for a complimentary uh, business diagnostic with you, okay? And if it is not appropriate after the call, then we keep in touch. Okay. That's the thing. If you like what you hear today, and if you think we should go deeper into some topics, please talk to your deputy representative. And I was talking to my team here as well about, hey, let's do this more often, you know? Paid or not paid, let's just build the community of entrepreneurs that are successful instead of the ones that open and close after five years. Okay, so thank you for your attention and Brahma, uh, I give it back to you. Okay, let's first start a quick Q&A session. Is there any of you who want to ask questions to Coach India? We open three people who want to ask questions. It's free. You don't have to pay. Any questions? One questions? Only one questions? Only one? Okay. There's only one. Um, um, survei makan survei dulu ya sebelum mulai sebuah bisnis. Kalau terus ada yang bilang mulai bisnis itu harus dari passion dulu sukanya apa. Tapi kalau ternyata uh, sukanya A, lalu survei um, untuk saat ini kemungkinannya kecil. Jadi uh, misalnya dari dari jenis suppliernya pun jumlah suppliernya masih sedikit. Tapi seperti itu depannya itu akan terus berkembang dan bagus. Tapi untuk mulai marketnya sekarang ini mungkin sulit. Nah itu gimana? Pertanyaan saya, apakah anda punya cash flow dan punya waktu untuk menunggu sampai market itu up, atau anda punya strategi untuk mengedukasi market supaya upnya lebih cepat? Untuk sekarang secara cash flow belum, karena saya mulainya sambil kerja. Okay, then it's very risky. So what she's asking is that people say you have to do business on what you're passionate about, right? But what if that thing you're passionate about is not even in trend yet, the market's not commercial yet, nobody really wants it, and you gotta wait, but you know it's coming, and in a couple of years it might be in fashion, right? 
So my question is, well, number one, do you have the cash flow and time to wait and build that business? Like Action Coach, when we started in 2001, how many people, if we said coaching, how many people would actually know what we're talking about? None. Okay? But we had the patience to build it up. And now there's lots of coaching companies that were born out of Action Coaches. Right? So, you have to have the cash to wait. Or, you have to have a strategy to educate the market, which is pretty much what we did, we implemented a lot of strategies to educate the market about what coaching is, and that takes cash too and time, yeah? So that it would go up faster. I don't know what would have happened in Indonesia, we'll never know, if our master of license said, you know, I, I don't really want to bother educating the market about that. You, pro I would probably be here today, right? So you gotta think about those two. Now, the deeper question is, pertanyaan yang lebih mendasar adalah, sebetulnya kalau kita mau buka bisnis, itu, Apa sih yang harus kita pikirin? Kan kalau kita bukan passion. Si, saya passion banget ngerjain pest control. Tapi saya nggak passion dengan pest control. Jijik banget tau nggak? Ya kan? But what was I passionate about? Saya passion itu tentang apa kalau gitu? Saya passion karena tentang pengalaman yang saya akan pelajari kalau saya bisa bangun bisnis ini. Saya bisa turn around service company. Saya jago banget deh, udah dari sisi servicenya. Saya passionate tentang leaders-leaders saya yang masih umurnya 20-an, whatever ini. Saya ingin mereka jadi leader, bukan hanya jadi staff sales. I'm passionate about the people development part. Saya passionate tentang um, belajar keuangan. Karena kalau mau turning around a business, harus ngerti keuangan. Ya, jadi itu yang passionnya. Atau saya passionate tentang duitnya. Karena kalau saya bisa, dan industri ini bagus, misalnya teman-teman kita yang bisnisnya uh, mining, namanya mereka passion gitu mining. Enggak. Palm oil, namanya dia, wah, I love that tree. Gitu, <laughs> gitu kan? Tapi dia like the money part. Yeah. Gitu kan? So the passion is about the dream. You know, the, this stuff. That's why this slide is very important. This slide. Passionnya tentang ini. Cepetan cari bisnis yang bisa menghasilkan lebih banyak uang dan scalable supaya bisa beli ini-ininya. Mungkin. Ada juga yang lucky, like I, I consider myself lucky, I like the business, I like coaching, and it gets me that. Itu lucky, tapi gak semua orang bisa. Okay. Let's just translate to the non-Indonesian friends, which is basically you have to understand what you are passionate about. I'm not passionate about turning around pest control because I love cockroaches. I don't like cockroaches. I'm sick of it, you know, but now I'm not anymore. But I'm passionate about the idea that if I can turn this around, I really will be really smart turning around service companies. I will be a really smart person. I will understand finance. And ultimately, some of you might discover I'm passionate about the money that particular business will bring because I want to buy more stuff. So that's why clarity on this is really important. Um, you know, people who do mining or palm oil, they're not passionate about the tree, they're not passionate about the gold and all this stuff that they mine out, the coal, they're passionate about the whole revenue. How many of you, I mean, you know, pregnant, how many of you are passionate, ladies, how many of you are passionate about being pregnant? You love the idea of expanding your stomach, you love the idea of puking every single day, how many of you are just passionate about that? No, but why do you go through it? Don't tell me it's an accident. But why do you go through it? Why do you go through the pain and the stuff? Because you want the, the baby. So some of us, and this is a very good question, thank you for bringing it up. Some of us spend too much time trying to find the process that we are passionate about. Actually what you should be passionate about is the goal. You go through the, excuse me, shit, to get through the goal. If the goal doesn't make you passionate, you won't go through the crap, yeah. right? See, getting pregnant is crap, but having that cute little baby that still pukes at you is the passionate stuff, right? So stop trying to find a business that you're passionate about the industry and everything, because for most of you, you're lucky you have it. But for some of us, we won't, because the stuff we're passionate about doesn't generate enough income to buy that stuff. The focus on that stuff. Is that, is that good? Okay. Sure.
Any other questions? Yes, in the front. Okay. And then we have one more. Hello, um, my name is Ifan from Awina Synergy Indonesia. Um, basically, for the past five years, uh, we are working together with um, several Japanese companies to provide electricity to places without access to electricity and also provide water to uh, places without access to water and also do some other consulting businesses helping uh, companies uh, doing business between Japan and Indonesia. So, um, and actually, um, we try to define ourselves to do, uh, to do business in, uh, as a social business in which we try to uh, do business to solve some social issues. Yep. So my question is, how, what, how is your observation about social business? Uh, and what do you think is the common issue that entrepreneurs who is involved in this social business are facing and, and what do you think is the solution for that? Maybe you have some other observation I look forward to. And maybe other friends are looking forward to hear more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Five years ago, we started a, uh, we started a initiative in action called, coach called action, uh, Coaching for a Cause. We coach nonprofit organizations for free. And the Gepi team here tomorrow is having their first coaching session for free. Okay, we're coaching Gepi so that you can have better services. Okay. Um, five years ago, we met up with this gentleman who is a religion teacher and the head of the communication forum of orphanages of all Indonesia. And then he whispered to his coach after being coached on, on the Action Club program, he says, I have a dream. I want to build an entrepreneurship school for underprivileged children. And the coach says, why not? He said, 10 years, why not next year? So that was five years ago. This is the Entrepreneurship School for Underprivileged Children. We now house 60 kids and teach poor kids entrepreneurship so we can break the chain of poverty in Indonesia. You know? Figure, it's like an incubator program, really, for poverty, for poor kids. This is their CD. Uh, if you want to donate to them, don't give us money. Just give us, just buy the CDs, 50,000 each. Their house just burned down for an electrical fire. We're using the CD to raise funds. It's 50,000 each. If you want more to give more, please, we welcome that. The snacks are their business units. That is, those business units, the five business units they have, generates uh, enough revenue to cover 50% of the uh, operational costs for 40 children. No, yes, 40, actually 40, because the 20 has just arrived, right? So 40 kids. So enjoy the snacks, that's their cooking. And that's, their, that's their number one fast-moving business unit. Yeah. The other they have is agriculture. We basically ask them to make businesses that can, they can bring home to their village later. They can, they can start in their village later. So the point is, it's a very interesting process to coach non-profit organizations. Social, at least social businesses still call themselves business. The, sometimes when you're coaching People who love social causes, they don't have the identity of a business person. They are afraid to make profit, they feel guilty selling a product, they can't increase price because it's that's not what God wants them to do, or something like that. You know what I mean? They get into a lot of mindset issues. Many social business also start with employees who are volunteers, sometimes, not all, yeah? So they feel guilty exercising those five ways to profit. Okay, so one of the mindset that I need to break through for nonprofit organizations and social businesses is that whole thing about I am a business person even though the amount of profit, the profit that I make has to go back to that cause. The only difference between a nonprofit, a social business, and a real for-profit business is where does the profit go? For nonprofit, you're not allowed to reserve more than a certain amount of profits. It's just the rules around profit. But the whole idea of make profit is that. And because they're not business people, they don't have the skills, they have a heart, but they don't have the skills to make business work. So there's like building systems. Oh, no, 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 I can do that. Don't worry. It's all nice, right? And when it comes to, see, body shop, I love that as a social business. Why? Because it, we don't, how many of you know that 
Body Shop is actually one of those social businesses. We buy the product because we like the perfume, we like the packaging, it's cute, it's great for Christmas. But it's actually going, through a, going to a very good cause for women empowerment. See, that's what I'm teaching the kids. I say, your packaging needs to be cute, your packaging needs to be good. People need to buy your product because they like it, not because they feel sorry for you. So quality mastery, delivery mastery is also going to be a, a challenge 